piece. Um, learn how to die, moralizing messages on macabre monuments, and it shows you I love my alliteration. My first degree was in English lit. Um, but today it's going to be about monuments, and more than that, because some people will know that one of my areas of specialization is the dance of death, and that's going to feature in this very full lecture as well. Um, now, this monument, which was used for PR purposes to announce this lecture, is um, a fairly late one. It's to um, a Dutch cleric in the south of the country, Andreas Dix, who died in 1711, and it's in Wijk near Maastricht. This is a rubbing from the Greenhill collection. And already we have a bit of a problem, because those of you who've heard lectures on macabre monuments before or read about them will possibly think that, yes, this is another one, a variation of a cadaver monument. Uh, the deceased, and indeed, as you can just see, um, yes, as you can see, um, the skeleton is wearing a beretta, which goes with the status of the deceased, Andreas Dix, and he's pointing at the motto here, Ekesum Pot Eris, and that is a well-known motto, behold, I am what you will be, and we'll see that again. Interestingly, the enlarged Roman capitals are also Roman numerals and they add up to 1711, the date of death. But if you were to think that especially I am as you will be, that must be the deceased himself, then notice the arrow in the hand of the skeleton, because that is the attribute of death. And so the question here already is, did the sculptor and perhaps the patron or designer consider this a macabre cadaver monument with an image of the deceased, or is this death? And after all, death is dead as well. And that ambiguity is something to keep in mind because all too often um, the assumption is that every skeleton or every cadaver on a tomb is a representation of the deceased. The term medieval selfie has even been used, but it's not as simplistic as that. Um, Take this one. I'm showing you monuments from not all over Europe, but certainly a lot from the Netherlands where I live, um, the UK, but also France. Um, and here we have a tomb slab in um, the south of me. I'm in uh, South Holland, and this is in Zeeland, in Hulst, very close to the Belgian border. And here we've got a large inscription. The tomb slab was originally to Jan Metz Paulus, who died in 1553, but a married couple was added later of the same family, admittedly. And you've got a single cadaver. And in this case, it's not an animated skeleton as we saw just now in the other example. This is very much a recumbent skeleton on what looks like a reed death mat, um, and that could well be the deceased himself. Although the inscription that emanates, well, if not from the deceased, from the skeleton, then certainly it's hovering above him in Latin, is from Isaiah uh, 38. Um, set your house in order for you will die, and it's in Dutch. Beschikt uw huis, want gij zult sterven. Um, and helpfully the text Isaiah is added in case you don't know it. So whether that is the deceased, it was probably always intended as a family tomb, the very large text compartment suggests that, but it could so easily be a symbolic figure of death, not certainly a representation of um, young Metz Powers himself. But indeed, cadaver monuments, I'm sure many of you have tuned in because you're expecting to hear more about them and to be shown some, and I already promised some French material. And one of the most wonderful, if you like this kind of thing, cadaver monuments is this one. Now in the Museum in Laon, but it was formerly in the Franciscan Church of the Cordelier. And it is to a very interesting figure who also featured as a monument of the month on the CMS website, Guillaume de Arsigny. Guillaume had a very long life, if that was any guarantee, he was a good physician, and certainly his um, high age at death proved that. He may have been in his early 90s, but certainly in his 80s. 
Earlier in his life, he traveled around Europe and into uh, the Arab world, picked up a lot of medical knowledge. And in his very last years, um, well, if not last year, full stop, um, he actually treated one of the, well, the French king who was suffering from his first bout of insanity, Charles Le Folle, Charles the Madman. But that's beside the point. What is interesting is here, first of all, the anatomical accuracy, Guillaume certainly knew what he was dealing with in terms of bodies and corpses, um, and he specified he wanted this type of monument, but his will was very specific. He left a large bequest to the church in which he was to be buried and stipulated that a sculpture should be made of his body as it would appear one year after his death. So no fresh corpse, but clearly an emaciated cadaver, dried out rather than rotted away. You can see the sunken eyes, the sockets here, the mouth partly open, uh, the sinew stretched out. Look at the uh, rib cage here, hands across. There's no shroud, and that's interesting. Uh, hands across the genitalia, uh, the legs all emaciated, and it was originally covered with black pigment to suggest putrefaction. And that is quite interesting itself because medieval people were quite aware of the stages of decay of the human body after death. Um, by contrast, when we look at the double decker monument um, to Archbishop Henry Chichely, and I'm grateful to Sarah Blick for her photographs, and I hope I have credited everyone correctly in this slide talk, um, but I'll be thanking people individually where possible. Um, Henry Chichely, interestingly, commissioned his monument in the 1420s, and it's a so called double decker tomb monument with the deceased in full well, not regalia, but in his case, archiepiscopal vestments um, lying on the upper tier of the monument, but on the lower tier, you've got a cadaver. And interestingly, this monument was completed by 1427. Pamela King has shown that to be very much the case, but Chichely didn't die until 1443. So every time he walked through the choir of his cathedral, he would have seen representations of himself in the future here as he would be laid out awaiting the resurrection and here as a cadaver. And interestingly, um, we know he left money for the regular maintenance of the pigments on his tomb, but this, what you see now, is a bit too clean and, and hygienic. That is 19th century polychromy. The colors of the original cadaver may have been indeed dark gray, perhaps, uh, or even closer to black. It's not impossible. Um, because we see that very much in this miniature in the British Library, uh, Manuscript Harlian 2917, where we've got, and I'll explain the tale of the three living and the three dead later in this talk, but this is the Pope, the Emperor and the King who are meeting their dead counterparts. You can see here the triple tiara, here uh, the imperial crown and the royal crown, and the three corpses are in three different stages of decay, grey and flesh, freshly dead, uh, already brown with white worms and then much more black in a yet further state of putrefaction. I hope you're not having your dinner anytime soon. So, the images we saw, um, Assigny certainly was colored, um, Chichely was probably also a different color. And we know, although this really, really, truly gruesome cadaver in Vianna, close to Utrecht in the Netherlands, uh, attributed to the Flemish sculptor Colain de Nola, um, commemorating, because this too is a double-decker tomb, um, a husband and wife, Philippotte van der Mark, died first in the mid-1530s, and her husband only some 20 years later, but um, the monument was commissioned after her death, and it's got the two dead lying in their shrouds, but freshly dead, in the upper tier. But in the lower tier, you've got a single cadaver, and it is of the most macabre character. You can see it's a male cadaver, you just about see that, 
you look straight into the rib cage and see the organs there. And it's interesting that it's being, well, it's not just being eaten, it's been largely eaten by worms. And those um, documentary evidence suggests were originally highlighted in gold paint, very tasteful. Now, cadaver monuments, um, you don't find them in Southern Europe, Spain, Italy, they never seem to have liked them much. And in Italy, I wonder whether it was the cult of the body beautiful that made the cadaver effigy a rather unpalatable image. But in the North, you find very much Interestingly, far more gruesome examples are to be found in Ireland. Not that many, but this one in Bewley in Ireland of around 1450, we don't know the identity, is a good case in point. Here too, you see the organs in the stomach cavity. The dead figure, male or female, is lying in an open shroud. Um, it's very effectively carved. But the point of these cadaver effigies, of course, is not just the Halloween horror show, it's there's much more to it. Because you see that here, and I think it's always uh, important to look at cadaver imagery in all its different facets and media and topics. So not just carved cadaver effigies, but also inside slabs and in a moment brasses as well. And this example from France to Abbot Jean de Blaisy, who died in 1439, so almost contemporary with the example in Ireland, uh, shows the abbot with his staff, so he's got that attribute at least, um, completely naked, no shroud is there, stomach cavity already opened, I'm suggesting here perhaps the bowels, um, but importantly, his soul is being carried up to heaven over here. You can see that two hands reach out from heaven. These presumably are clouds. And here the deceased is making his way, his soul at least, into heaven. And that is the important contrast. The body itself is ephemeral, it's temporal, all flesh is subject to decay, but the soul is eternal. And that is the important dichotomy, the body, forget about it. No need to pamper it in life because you only have it for a short while. It will be resurrected and you will be, as a soul, reunited with your body at the last judgment. But in the meantime, you should focus on your soul. And of course, Job has often been quoted. Um, I refer back to Pamela King, I've already mentioned, and um, Cohen, the famous book on macabre monuments, still um, a very important book, um, not to be overlooked for all its omissions. Job, um, and I'm quoting here the King James Version because that is so much more explicit. You won't find this in the modern translations. It is about embracing the future fate of the body. I have said to rottenness, thou art my father, and to worms, you are my mother and my sister. So embrace it. Your body is not going to last forever. You might as well not pamper it at all. For I know that my redeemer liveth, we all know the words, and in the last day I shall rise out of the earth, and I shall be clothed again with my skin, and in my flesh I will see my God. However corrupt the body, however much it may decay in the grave, God will eventually resurrect it in its full glory and you'll have your skin and your flesh again and your eyes with which you will see God. The resurrection is a very physical affair, as is the hereafter. Um, so these monuments do quite a lot. They um, are evidence of the faith of the deceased, their belief in the resurrection. They show humility. We too will become just mere corpses. We're all alike in the grave. And in a period, because cadaver monuments start to appear in the late 14th century, and that is also the time when the portrait in all its individual likeness starts to appear, the warts and all portraits, um, 
Cadaver monuments are actually in many ways negations of individual likeness, because you wouldn't recognize these people if you met them in the street. Even their gender is indistinct, only their relative positions will make it clear that this must be the wife for us on the right, and that must be the husband, but nothing in their anatomy, well, no, uh, makes that clear. This is, I have to say, a very extreme form of cadaver brass to Richard Howard who died in 1499, and his wife Cecily in Aylsham in Norfolk, with thanks to Martin Stutchfield for the rubbing. Now, medieval selfie is not my term, but it has been used. Um, that's certainly suggested by the last will and testament of Elizabeth de Spencer, Countess of Warwick, who died in 1439. Um, a few cadaver monuments are to women, uh, most to men, but not all. And Isabel said, and I'm not go going to quote the whole thing, but the green bits are important because she wants my image to be made all naked and no thing on my head, but mine hair cast backwards. Um, and then she has the comparison of what else she wants. So it is her, her image, all naked, her head, her hair. It's very much how she envisages herself, just as, uh, D'Arsigny, Guillaume D'Arsigny, wanted an image of his body one year after death. Um, and it's interesting because when you start looking at the continent, um, interesting how many quite famous people had cadaver monuments. Um, many of you will be aware that the painter Hubert van Eyck, who started the Ghent altarpiece or the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb in St. Bardo's uh, Cathedral in Ghent, um, he died a few years after taking on the commission in 1426. And although his tomb slab, which is now in the ruins of St. Bardo's Abbey in Ghent, where the lapidarium is housed, um, that tomb slab is missing its brass inlay, but you can see the indents and even the rivets very clearly. Um, it would have had quatrefoils here, presumably with the evangelist symbols, um, possibly with arms if he had any. The epitaph would have been on a large plaque here across the body, but you can see from the legs and the ankle bones that this was indeed semi-skeletal figure. And the epitaph, which I'm not going to quote in full, actually says, and I'll just let you hear some Dutch, Spiegelt u aan mij die op mij treden, ik was als gij. And Spiegelen, mirror yourself in me, you who tread on me, I was like you once. So it's the deceased, very much so, um, speaking from the grave to passers-by. And um, he even introduces himself by name, Hubrecht van Eyck was ik genaamd, I was called Hubert van Eyck. Now, Spezer der Wormen, food for worms, formerly famous and highly honoured for my painting. It has been suggested that this monument was originally placed in the Vey Chapel, where his famous altarpiece is housed, or used to be housed, um, but it ended up elsewhere, and the epitaph was recorded before the brass was stripped away. Now, there are quite a few variations. Um, those of you of a ghoulish inclination may prefer the naked, um, shriveled, or worm-riddled um, effigies in their shrouds, but you can have the freshly dead figures laid out in their shroud ready for burial. Um, you find these, uh, quite a number of them, in Belgium, uh, in Bruges, both of these in St. Saviour's Cathedral, with thanks to Ronald von Bella, the double shroud bar, brass to Joris de Munter and Jacomine von der Brugge, who died in the um, early decades of the 15th century. And again, there is no distinction between husband and wife. Their faces are partly covered by their shrouds and quite elegantly um, drawn they are on this brass, beautiful patterned background, crosses in their um, covered hands, or at least laid on their abdomen. And here um, in negative, um, of the shroud brass of Walter Koopman, or Koopman, who died in 1387. So that's a single figure. There's even a banderole in both cases, actually here too and here too, um, and here, and you've got the name Walter Koppmann very clearly um, over 
the figure himself with um, the arms to identify uh, the figure even further. And they're wonderfully elegant. These are, well, are they dead? Are they ready for burial or are they in their tombs awaiting the resurrection? That is too quite ambiguous, as we'll see in a moment. Because sometimes, and um, in my work for the MEMO or Med Medieval Memoria online project at Utrecht University uh, quite some years ago, I um, went with a photographer to study and measure and photograph the tombs in the Church of Our Lady in Capella in Zeeland. A uh, wonderfully rich church, well worth a visit if you can get in. And there are quite a number of shroud brasses here, although the shrouds are so elegantly draped, they look like Roman togas. Um, here, and that is fairly exceptional, most of the figures have their eyes closed, except for this example uh, of Jakob Willem Jakobson and um, his son, uh, Canon Peter Jakobson, who are lying depicted side by side on a large slab. And um, the canon here very clearly has his eyes open. He's quite alert, both of them. One of them, at least the canon, has his hands raised in prayer. His father's got his hands crossed and down. Um, I say his father, they could actually be brothers as well. Um, but um, Certainly, Jakob Willem Jakobson died in 1531, and the monument was for both of them. And you can see he was the priest because he's got the chalice here. So the alertness is interesting because there was a medieval belief in a renovance, um, a revenance, sorry about that. And more about that in a moment, because what you see here, and again in Zeeland, but in a nearby church, Oudelande, um, here we've got a pair of tomb slabs to a husband and wife, Christophe Cornelison and his wife Marieke. They each have their own grave and tomb slab, although one has to assume Christophe was a lot bulkier than his wife because his tomb stone is markedly wider than that of his wife. And what you see here is a view from above. You see them lying in their coffins, but at the same time stepping out, you can see the feet of Marika, one of them, the right foot, moving forwards. And both of them are actually pushing away the lids of their coffins. You can see here the attempt at perspective. Um, so they are actually waking up. Um, Christoffel's tomb slab is particularly worn and unfortunately his coat of arms has been hacked away and we can't see whether the eyes are open, but there is certain animation, there is no doubt about that. They are about to step out of their coffins and face their maker. This is the moment of the resurrection. So, that is a different form of cadaver monument, if you can call it that. But as I said at the very beginning, you have to be very careful of assuming that everything is straightforward, medieval selfies and representations of the dead. In this monument, again in the Netherlands and very close to where I'm sitting in Gouda, or Gouda, where the cheese comes from and where I was born, in the Netherlands, we've got a wonderful high relief tomb slab to a priest, Johannes Zantius, and he is here complete with his vestments, lying with his head on a cushion, his feet in repose, but beneath him is the much smaller cadaver recumbent lying at his feet above the text Covita Mori, um, think of death. And in this case, I don't think we're dealing with a representation of the deceased himself. The very proportions are different. This is not a double-decker monument. In this case, I think that the cadaver is there as a symbol, a reminder of death, but also a victory over death. The moment of resurrection that we saw with the tombs in Auderlande just now, the faith in the resurrection and the knowledge that at the resurrection, you will vanquish death. And so the diminutive figure of the cadaver here is a representation in my view of death vanquished. Although you must still remember, you have to pass through that stage in order to make it to the last judgment. 
Um, and this is quite interesting. A one-to-one -one relationship on a tomb can make you wonder whether you're dealing with a double-decker monument with two representations of the deceased. But that isn't always the case. Um, in this case, a monument um, to three family members in Peipingen, now in Belgium, we've got Pierre Derbet, the second who died in 1523, his wife and possibly his, their son. They're all of them kneeling on their monument, but beneath in the lower register is a single death figure. Now you may think that it must be of the husband and there isn't space to have three corpses side by side. But there are other explanations, just as there were in Chauda just now. This effigy is pretty much life-size, but it is not unique, the combination of multiple um, OV effigies with a combination of a single cadaver in a lower register. An example, and um, I know that Christina Welch has discussed that and very cleverly demonstrated that the cadaver now on this monument has been swapped with another one in the same church, a um, bit of a mix up, but it's still the case that this monument in Woolerton Church in Nottinghamshire to Sir Richard Willoughby, who died in 1471, and his wife Anne, who predeceased him, they are represented in the upper tier, not by carved effigies, but by brasses, and you can see the rubbings here. But in the lower register, we have, whether it or not it has been swapped, and that seems quite likely, a single cadaver. And again, I think also because of the juxtaposition, the cadaver below, the effigies OV, admittedly in brass above, suggests a symbolic value of the or meaning of the effigy. It's not the deceased or one of the two deceased, it is a representation of death ultimately vanquished. You see that here as well, I'm giving you quite a few examples, but to make the point that this is not exceptional, um, even though most double-decker monuments have that one-to-one -one relationship. This one, again, a rather late one in Breeden on the Hill in Derbyshire, close to where I used to live. Um, and I thank John Bayliss who sent me some photographs um, only this afternoon, but I'd already found some other ones, um, with thanks to Kat Irving, although she must, may not know I've used them. The credits are there. Um, this monument in Alabaster by a local workshop is to, Francis Shirley, who died in childbirth, age 29, but only the epitaph will tell you that. Francis kneeling here behind her husband and surviving son, with her daughter behind her, um, they're all turned towards the east. In front lie several cradles here, two of children, maybe the one who caused her death in childbirth, uh, children who failed to live, and below, is a single, and this is truly a skeleton laid out on a mat on a sarcophagus. So the monument itself doesn't suggest that it's just to Francis Shirley. Um, the husband is at least as prominent, he's at the forefront, but there is that single cadaver and it, it looks quite desolate. Whether that represents Francis Shirley, I'm doubtful. And that's certainly the case with that monument I showed you earlier in Vian. And as I explained, it's a double-decker monument. The canopy is actually a century later. Reinhard von Brederode commissioned this to himself and his wife. You see their effigies here with a slightly restored tip of the nose, but very much an idealized representation, almost Grecian here, that profile. They lie freshly dead in their shrouds on the upper tier, a single cadaver below, that isn't just it, because it's part of a whole ensemble. And again, I'm grateful to Trudy Brink, who has published on this monument, um, because part of that ensemble in the church in Vianna, in the Brederode Chapel, is um, this unfortunately badly damaged vetable, which originally held a relief of the resurrection of Christ, flanked by representations of the family, husband and wife with their offspring. So you have 
the couple, freshly dead and looking towards the Red Hall, on which they themselves appeared as resurrected praying figures. And the cadaver below is more likely to be once again a symbolic representation of death, not one of the deceased themselves. But it's fluid. Never say there is just one explanation. Everyone who commissioned such a monument or who carved one, produced one, may have had his or her own ideas about what it was meant to represent. Um, this one, again, with thanks to Trudy Brink, who uh, will soon be publishing this as a Monument of the Month on the CMS website. This wall monument to Jos Sospart and his wife Katharina von der Meer, again by the same sculptor as the one in Bianen, Colleen de Nole, can be found in the Church of St. Eusebius in Arnhem. Now, that church was badly hit in the Second World War but the monument had by then already lost its central relief and it was not a resurrection image, it was a nativity. We know that from early records, but below, and it's quite interesting because Jos Saspau died in 1546 and his wife Katharina then left Arnhem to go back to The Hague where the couple came from and she died only 14 years later. And when you look at the two figures laid out on their death mat here below in the lower tier of the monument, you see very much a cadaver with um, the stomach cavity all open, showing the rib cage and the spine. And beside that figure is the freshly dead figure also shrouded of the wife. So that here, the difference in death dates seems to be reflected on the monument, whether they knew beforehand, whether it was going to be 14 years between them, or whether this was made. Um, it was actually created for the husband after his death and the wife was buried in The Hague, so um, she wasn't going to join her husband. But it's certainly true that um, she was still alive, presumably, when this was commissioned, or not presumably, we know she was. Um, and again, death can come in many forms. Um, so always bear that in mind, that it can have symbolic meaning. And that's certainly the case on um, this monument in Chesterfield in the Church of St. Mary's and All Saints in Derbyshire, church famous for its crooked spire. The chapel has various monuments to the full jam family, but we don't, at least to the best of my knowledge, still we don't know who is being commemorated by this monument. The deceased, him or herself, is shown as a shrouded effigy, and that is not unique. There is a famous monument um, elsewhere in Derbyshire in Fenny Bentley. But above the deceased of an uncertain uh, gender, we've got the representations of old age, and youth as a very overblown toddler with a whirly gig, and between them, a representation of death with a spade and an arrow pointing down and standing on a skull. A rather muscular death, but the head is very much a skull. So the deceased is covered up in the shroud and death is the animated figure. And it really is death personified. Now, here we come to that tale I promised you earlier, because as I said before, um, to look at cadaver effigies in isolation is missing quite a lot of the overall picture of the macabre in medieval and Renaissance culture. And that is literature as well as um, art and including two monuments. The tale of the three living and the three dead is quite well known. It appears um, in the late 13th century as a poem, a dialogue poem. The story is that three young men, often but not always represented as three kings, uh, go out hunting. They're certainly wealthy, young, in pursuit of pleasure, which happens to be hunting, and during their hunt, they encounter three animated corpses, and those corpses 
Well, it changes because in this case, this is rather a late example, French Book of Hours of around 1500 in Manchester, the John Rylands Library. And we see on one page of this prayer book, the three living riding away on horseback with signs of panic, and they are being pursued by the three dead who emerge from a cemetery. And here, in fact, you see a charnel house with the bones of the um, dug up deceased left here to dry out further. And the three dead are armed with a spear, a coffin and a spade. And that's very much, of course, a grave digger's implement. But it is a clear pursuit. That Three dead are threatening figures, spectres. Well, anyone would be upset to see figures like that animated, but that's not how it started. Um, this motif became quite popular. So the three living go out hunting, meet these three corpses. They speak variations of, um, as I am now, so will you be. And they actually have a positive message to begin with because they allow the three living to repent of their wicked ways of just pursuing earthly pleasures. And the three living have the chance to mend their ways and devote themselves to God and as the salvation of their souls in the hereafter. Uh, this is a reconstruction by Anne Worrell uh, to be found on um, the this website that I've put in here. Um, and it's the South Wall of St. Nicholas Church in Charlwood in Surrey. Um, the archer actually is from a late wall painting that was superimposed, but the original wall painting of around 1300 showed the three living approaching on horseback, complete with their hunting birds, and the three dead as three skeletal figures, who you can see there the rhetorical gesture with the hand are warning the living. Um, and a famous example, which I'm sure many of you will know, is in the Psalter of Robert the Lyell in the British Library in London. This particular page was illuminated around 1310. And the um, wonderful thing is that you've got, apart from the miniature, the whole text. The English version of the poem is actually of a much later date. But here you get the French version, but with Latin captions in red rubrics. Uh, the three vivus regibus, the three living king or divis, uh, the three dead kings, so they're clearly dead, and you can see that here. Then you get the French poem uh, with the three figures, each in turn saying something. But um, above, you've actually got a Middle English discussion, and the three living at the very top say, Ich am afraid, I'm afraid. Look what I see. I think it must be three devils. And you can see the three kings in various, not panic yet, complete puzzlement. They're really baffled about what's going on. And it looks very polite, actually, as an encounter. And the three dead, no threatening behavior here. They say, I was well fair, such as we are, shall you be. For God's love, beware by me, take warning by our example. And it's wonderful to show them as um, mirror images. Here, the full frontal um, death figure with the open stomach cavity, so his body is in an advanced state of decay, is looking at us and grinning. And here, he almost matches the full frontal pose of the third king. This one with the head bowed is mirrored in this one. And they face one another and notice again the stages of decay, they're all three brown, the three dead, but this one's still wearing a shroud, but here the maggots are at play. Um, it's pretty gruesome. But it is a seemingly polite conversation. As I said, the whole point of the story, the tale of the three living and the three dead, was the three living should be given the chance to mend their ways. And that changes because we saw that earlier in that manuscript in Manchester. Um, early manuscripts around 1300 and the early 14th century, um, you still get that polite conversation, but increasingly the image becomes more violent and the three dead really start pursuing the three living. 
And what is interesting is that um, so often we think of cadaver monuments as having a commemorative function, but the three living and the three dead is just a moralizing tale, but that too can be given a commemorative function. Because here in this image of lethal pursuit in the uh, hours, prayer book, of Maximilian, or sorry, Mary of Burgundy and her husband Maximilian, the later emperor, Maximilian I, dated around 1480, but it might just be slightly later because in 1482, Mary, who was a keen huntress and actually was supposedly sleeping with a hunting bird in her bedroom, which um, her husband wasn't too pleased about, she was pregnant when she went out hunting. She fell off her horse and the combined effect of pregnancy and a heavy fall uh, caused her death. And that happened in 1482. And it's either highly prophetic or it is a retrospective image of what happened. Usually the three dead, as I said, are three noblemen or three kings. But in this case, one of them is a woman and she is the one at most um, under threat of death. Um, one of the three dead, and notice how black these figures are. Um, the other two men are fleeing, but Mary seems unlikely to escape with her life. So this is quite an apt, and I think it's more likely to post-date Mary's death than to um, prophesy what was going to happen to her a few years down the line. And it's interesting that this kind of image can also be found on two monuments. Now, I owe this photograph to Jerome Bertram, and I know that this incised slab has been published by the MBS, the Monument and Brass Society, before, so you can find it in the index online on the MBS website. Uh, this is just a fragment of a broken tomb slab in size, as you can see, um, it would have continued further up, you've got the evangelist symbols in the corner, but here, and I hope you can see it in the lower register, you've actually got the three living on horseback and the three dead as standing figures, not threatening, this dates from the first half of 15th century, so it's relatively late, uh, but we don't have the pursuit, but it's interesting that it is found on a tomb monument. And indeed, the macabre can make its way into different forms of commemoration and different forms other than the cadaver effigy that is so well known. The cadaver effigy is certainly um, quite a familiar image, but there are other ways of commemoration. It's often thought, and mis the mistake has been made by historians in the past of thinking that um, children weren't commemorated because they weren't given mon monuments. And as I said in my earlier talk um, in the spring, um, there are different ways of commemorating the dead, including paying for candles, for masses to be said, for their souls in perpetuity, if you can afford that kind of money, but also in stained glass. And this one in the church in Stanford on Avon in Northamptonshire is the only surviving example of um, quarrels, as they're called, stained glass panels, which um, the vicar of the church, Henry Williams, who died in 1501, commissioned in his will of the previous year. You see him kneeling in the stained glass with opposite him, with a very easy aim, death rising from an open grave and shooting an arrow at him. And that is precisely what Henry Williams wanted because in his will of the 5th of April, 1500, he said that, I will that the glass windows in the chancel with imagery that was therein before, should also have my image kneeling in it and the image of death shooting at me in small quarrels of as good glass as can be gotten. No expense is spared. He wants good glass. It should be more than one quarrel, but only one survives. And it shows exactly what um, he wanted, an image of him kneeling and the image of death shooting at me. So death too, not just, and that is where the um, again, the blurred lines between the dead in the tale of the three living and the three dead and death personifies occurs 
because the three dead can have various implements, grave digger implements, coffin, spade, but also javelins and um, actual um, weapons. And then we've got another theme, the last one of the three. So we've got the Cadaver Monument in all its varieties, uh, the three living and the three dead, which is pretty rare, but can have a commemorative function even in a manuscript perhaps. And then the last and my special subject, the Dance of Death. Because on this brass of park and housekeeper James Gray, who died in 1591 in Hunsdon in Hertfordshire, and I owe this photograph to the late David Kelsall, um, we see, and it's wonderful, wonderful irony. James Gray is shooting with his crossbow, which he actually left to one of his servants in his will. Um, he is shooting at a stag who's still running away. But it's actually death who kills both the hunter and the hunted. Um, the hunted, the stag, is killed not by the arrow from the crossbow that James Gray is holding, but by death's arrow. And death actually says, sick perigo, thus I continue. And actually, I can't help it, this is ironic. The hunter thinks he's killing the stag, but he is himself a victim, as is the stag. They both die. And well, I'll explain about the Dance of Death in a moment, but um, it's certainly a motif that seems to have influenced quite a number of two monuments in Scandinavia, but not an example I'm showing you here. Instead, but thanks once again to my colleague and friend Trudy Brink, we've got an example in the museum in Groningen, but originally from the parish church of Wetzingen. And we've got a husband and wife, we see here an antiquarian drawing and here a photograph of the tomb in high relief. The husband and wife and death with an hourglass and arrow, we've got the arrow here and the hourglass here, standing behind the couple and almost embracing them both. Um, they died at various times here, I'm just going to move this, 1564 and 1575, the wife died last, um, but in, on the two monument there's no escape, they both become inevitably victims of death. And it's death personified, not a representation of either the deceased or of a vanquishing of death. It's death who is the victor here. The living have no escape. Um, and quite a few examples, and I have published on them before, so those of you who've read my work will know quite a few of these. Um, the, Tomb monument, uh, unfortunately lost, destroyed with the rest of the church of Neil Capella in the First World War, is um, with thanks to Ronald von Belle, who corrected the earlier literature. Um, it's a boy, Giljamke van de Kerkhove. We think that uh, it says Kerhove, but it should be Kerhove most likely, who died, as the banderol says, at the age of nine weeks. Kiliamke, or William, um, is buried here, skulls in the corner of the slab, um, now, as I said, destroyed. Photograph, by the way, of the Greenhill collection. So in that way, the tomb slab still exists. And Children were all too often subject to an early death. Um, infants in particular were very vulnerable, infection and all kinds of diseases. And here the swaddled baby is being stabbed mercilessly by a rather diminutive death figure. Um, they're not quite in proportion. But it is quite telling that the child, or usually the infant, is a recurring motif, a participant in the dance of death. And we see a wonderful hand-colored woodcut here of a German block book uh, print uh, from the Heidelberg Tortentanz in the Heidelberg University Library. And we've got the figure of death. And actually, uh, death says here quite cruelly, an, crawl this way, you must learn how to dance. And the baby replies, he's really quite a naked little toddler. Ach, ach we lieber Mutter mein, oh my dear mother, a black man, that's quite telling, pulls me away. Black man, the color of death and putrefaction. 
Now, a few things more, because otherwise I'm already probably overrunning, um, about the dance of death, because that too had, or that's my theory, at least my hypothesis, could have a commemorative function. Because when you look at this woodcut, and the text says that it is um, the verses, the first stanza is um, um, the words of Un Roi Mort, a dead king. It is the final woodcut of a dance macabre edition that was published in Paris in 1485, but based on a famous mural in Paris, which was executed between August 1424 and Lent 1425. It starts with an author and then follows the dance of death. I'll explain in a moment what that is. And it finishes with the author once again, beholding a dead corpse of a king, Roi Mort, um, with the crown rolled to the ground and the finger of the deceased actually pointing to the earth. Now, the dance of death or the danse macabre in French, but interestingly, um, in Spanish, it's the danza de la muerte, but in Dutch and in German, we call it the Doden dance, Torten dance, or dance of the dead. And once again, as I said before, you've got that confusion, you might say, of whether it's about death personified or the dead, remember, revenants, who come from their graves to um, hound or warn or summon the living. And in the case of the dance of death, it's summoning. The three living got a reprieve in the dance of death. There is no such reprieve. It is the moment of death and there is no repentance possible. So this wall painting, an early example of the mid to later 15th century in the Church of Notre Dame in Kerr Maria in Brittany, with thanks to Ilona Ancola, um, my colleague in France and the president of the French Dance Macabre Society. And you get this alternating chain of, you can see here a king, a dead figure, and here a prelate, Archbishop, a dead figure, um, a knight or constable, a dead figure, a bishop, a dead dancer, and so on and so forth. So you've got this alternation, which makes it very unlikely that it's death personified in each case. It is more likely, as it says in Dutch and German, a dance of the dead. And you see that here too in um, a painting that is a copy of a lost scheme in Lübeck by Bernd Notke, um, 15th century. And once again, we've got the author or preacher here at the start, then a very musical bagpipe playing, skeletal or corpse really. And then we get, and they're really frolicking about the dead dancers. And here's the Pope and the dead dancer, and then the emperor, dead dancer, a woman. That's a German thing, not French. Cardinal, you can see here, king. Um, and every time you've got a dead dancer linking the living. So what's the dance macabre or dance of death? In its pure form, it is a hierarchical sequence of multiple confrontations between death, or as I said, the dead, and the living from all levels of society, from Pope and Emperor, as you see here, and these are woodcuts from that same early edition of 1485. Um, so Pope and Emperor to start, and it's an um, alternation of um, clerical and secular figures, so starting with the Pope and then the Emperor, and it goes down the social scale to Cardinal and King, as we saw just now in the German version, uh, Patriarch and Constable, that's really French, but also uh, occurs in uh, the Spanish dance of death. And then it ends with, indeed, um, the baby in the cradle, uh, Clark, hermit, and death again. Um, and it finishes, indeed, with death. The hermit is pretty ready for death. The child predece uh, uh, precedes him um, with the monk. And what is interesting is the original French dance macabre and the origins of even the very term macabre are still subject for great debate, um, whether it's to do with the Maccabees, the book of the Maccabees, or whether it's an Arabic term for burial, we just don't know. It may even have been a personal name in English. Uh, John Lydgate in the 15th century talks about uh, Dr. Macabre or Macabre of the Doctor. In the French scheme, it's 
all male. The German and English versions and the Spanish dancer as well have some female characters. And what is interesting, and also the reason why this particular motif is so long living, is that it's not just a warning about death and memento mori scheme, but it also mixes the warnings with social satire. So you can have great fun. A pope who's got to start the dance because he's so mighty and uh, of such high status. Well, popes don't normally dance. So there's an awful lot of irony, but also possibly a bit more because the first monumental dance ever recorded as a poem, uh, the theme probably starts in the 14th century, but it really only comes to the, um, to the fore in 1424 when this mural in Paris is started with a clearly adapted poetic text. Whoever the author was of the original poem, the poem that we now know is an adaptation of an earlier version. It was finished at Lent, that was February 1425, and it was painted on the back walls of the arcade beneath the charnel house, I explained that a moment ago, on the south side of the cemetery of the Holy Innocents in the heart of Paris. And that's interesting, during the English occupation of the city, when both King Henry V had died in August 1422, and a couple of weeks later, his father-in-law, King Charles III, um, the uh, sixth um, mad King Charles. And what is interesting is that in the woodcut that was based on the mural, we've got a king with a beard, but with a mantle that makes him unmistakably a French king, because you've got the fleur de lis here, and here too on his scepter but in a much earlier representation that is very close in date to the actual mural, which sadly was destroyed in 1669. This manuscript in the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, shows a border with various figures being summoned by death. Here's the Pope and here's the Cardinal, but here's the King, and the King has that mantle with Fleur de Lis, unmistakably a King of France, not only that, but he looks remarkably like Charles VI, Mad King Charles, who died on the 21st of October, 1422, and this mural was started less than two years later in the heart of Paris, along the route to Saint-Denis, where the French kings and queens were buried. And for comparison, this is Charles's effigy at Saint-Denis, still survives. He was beardless. This is him on the famous reliquary of the golden horse, that's golden Rüssel, which is now in Bavaria. It was originally commissioned by the queen for her husband, King Charles VI. And it's got the king in his blue mantle with fleur de lis, uh, kneeling at a predio in front of the Madonna and child in beautiful gold and enamel. And the resemblance is striking. The woodcut, which is some 60 years later, um, may show the king with longer hair and a beard, but this is very close in date to the mural and to the date of the king's death. Um, and when you look at the text, and I could tell you a lot more, but I'm referring you to my articles on the subject, um, the dead king here in the final woodcut is being given the words, I'm not going to read them all out, but it addresses the reader and you who can see on cette poutreture, which is really in plural, in these likenesses that preceded the image of the dead king, so all the dead and living dancers, or rather the living dancers, you can see men of various estates dancing. Um, here, it's about him, um, it is nothing but meat for worms. That is what human life and the human body is, meat for worms. And he, and he's pointing at himself almost, um, Jules Le Monstre, I demonstrate this lying here on my bare, uh, back. I, who was once a crowned king. And it is so telling that when this mural was painted, neither France nor England had a crowned king. Um, the Dauphin was going to be crowned in 1429 with the help of Joan of Arc, of course, you know the story. And Henry VI is going to be crowned as still a young boy soon after the French uh, beat the English there. So 
this image on a mural in the center of Paris with a living king towards the start in a French royal mantle, whose words also have resonances of the life of Charles VI, but I can't explain that here. Um, and then finishing with a dead king who was once a crowned king, but no more, the crown is on the ground. That would have had enormous repercussions for the contemporary viewers. This is not a symbolic dead king and shrug the shoulders, it's just meant to be a general image. No, this really hit home. And the same would have been true in London, because around 1430, a mural scheme was commissioned by the London town clerk, John Carpenter, for Parham Churchyard at Old St Paul's Cathedral. That too um, didn't survive the Reformation, but that mural cycle had verses by John Lydgate, who visited Paris in 1426 and produced a Middle English adaptation, it's more than a translation, and in whose poem specific mention is made of the late King Henry V. So in both murals, again, the image of the dead king who was once crowned and the living king who was quite mighty, um, that would have held repercussions because people would have been only too aware of kings they'd lost. Charles, who was for a while the last French king because Paris was ruled by the Duke of Bedford, and England, which had a baby king in Henry VI. Um, here we've got, of course, a portrait of Henry V. Now, I've nearly reached the end of my talk. Um, crypto portraits, a rather mysterious term, but that is what we mean, um, but what we mean by that hidden portraits that look like something else, but actually represent a specific person. In Holbein's woodcut of the dance of death that he designed in the early 1520s, but it was only published in 1538, here we see the image of um, death and the king, and death is acting as a cupbearer, and the king is seated underneath a canopy with schematic fleur-de-lis, and the big nose and the hat and the beard is very reminiscent of um, Francis François Premier of France, of course the counterpart to Henry VIII, king of France, here in a portrait by Jean Clouet. And to my mind, it's absolutely certain that Holbein was referring to Francis in this woodcut. We've got um, remnants of dance of death cycles in England. Most murals have disappeared. We've got records of them. Um, there's one, but hidden behind wooden paneling in Stratford on Avon in the Guild Chapel. We've got a single. Uh, stained glass window left from a much larger cycle. And it's interesting that this was, um, this panel and the whole cycle, Death and the Bishop here, um, was um, probably paid for by um, a bequest to the church by um, the Norwich mayor and grocer Nicholas Coolidge, who was buried in this church. He died in 1502. He left money to the church for the fabric for a renovation of the church. And it may well have been the case that this mural scheme um, was part of that renovation. And so it would have had a commemorative function, apparently in the full scheme, um, Coolidge's um, uh, coat of arms were visible. And we've got something similar in the wall painting in the Guild Chapel, which was commissioned around the same time by former London Mayor Hugh Clopton. Now, I will end almost with a few uh, schemes, just to recap, because as I said, this is about more than just carved cadavers. They are part of a much larger macabre culture in the medieval period. And when it comes to cadaver figures, they can represent the deceased themselves as a corpse in various states of decay, freshly dead, putrefying, with or without worms and toes, etc., or emaciated, desiccated, um, or a writhing and about to face God or stepping out of the coffin, speaking and animated corpses, variations of the above but also not the deceased, but representations of death conquered, and then it's very symbolic, or they can be the actual personifications of death himself, 
in a variety of interactive roles, approaching, summoning, dispatching the living, or addressing and warning the viewer. And just a little scheme, I have fun with this because it's about timelines. Death is timeless. Death personified is of all times until we come to the last judgment, when death ceases to exist. Death is then conquered. We, me, I talking to you and you listening to me, or I hope so, uh, we are in the now, but that's a very brief moment. In a moment, we, tomorrow, next week, next year, we could be dead. But that's the future as we are now. And then there are the dead who predeceased us, the past. Now, for uh, Chichely, when he commissioned this two monument, of course, he himself was living, but every time he passed this monument, he would have been reminded of the future, the different stages, the putrefying body and the body about to be resurrected in full glory. And so those are two states in the future. But of course, for us in the now, they're all in the past. That is the thing. And you see that here, me, you, now living, that is the moment when the dance of death hits you and there is no repentance. Death is absolute, it hits you, bang. The trancey effigy, if it's for us and we commission it, that's the future. But it can still, if they belong to someone else, talk to us in the now. Then they belong to people who've died before us. Same is true for the three living and the three dead. They have died, but come to us in the now to warn us, and then we have still time to repent. That's not the case in the dance of death, where it could be, once again, the dead come from their graves to summon us, to join them. Um, and as I said, the trancy effigy too, we look forward to what we are, and we may commission our own trancy effigy, which then looks back to us and warns us of what we will become. But the message in each case is repent before it's too late. In the case of the dance of death, it is too late. There's no more repentance possible. With the other warnings, and that is what they are about, of course, all the time, warning us where we'll, our turn will come as well. But there is that ambiguity, and that is worth taking away. In this case, the tomb at the convent of Simang in Fusen in Bavaria, Abbot Gregor Gerhoch, who died in 1554, is depicted here being confronted with death with his scythe and his hourglass. And for comparison, I've included Holbein's woodcut of Death and the Abbot, in which death has already appropriated the abbot's mitre and his staff, and the fat abbot is being pulled along without mercy. But where I started, on the two monument of Andreas Dix in Weg, it is ambiguous whether the figure there is indeed Weg, no, sorry, Andreas Dix himself, or whether it's death personified. But ultimately, from where we are, it is the same thing, isn't it? It is death of all times and death in the past, but it's definitive death. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention and happy Halloween those of you who are still here. Thank you.